It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tim McAllister today. He is a principal research scientist in ruminant nutrition and microbiology in Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Lethbridge Research Center. Dr. Tim McAllister grew up on his parents' cow-calf farm in Incifal, Alberta. He obtained a bachelor in agriculture and master's from the University of Alberta in Edmonton and a PhD with distinction in ruminant nutrition and microbiology from the University of Yale, Ontario. He accepted a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Calgary in 1991 and joined Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge in 1992. Dr. McAllister has been a research scientist in rumen microbiology, feeding and nutrition since 1997 and is presently in charge of a diverse research team with part of their program developing strategies to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and ruminant production. His research focuses on several aspects of microbiology, nutrition, and beef production, and on food and environmental safety issues related to li livestock production. Strategies for mitigation of Escherichia coli 15787, prion and inactivation within the environment, antimicrobial resistance in bacteria in feedlots, and investigating the discovery and characterization of fibrolytic enzymes from human microbes. With an H index of 117 and an I10 index of 776, he is the author or co-author of over 900 publications and over 90 reviews. To date, Dr. McAllister has supervised 30 masters and 33 PhD students, and his lab currently has seven masters and eight PhD students. He's a recipient of numerous awards, including the Alunco Award for the Production of Safe and Affordable Food, American Feed Industry Research Award, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal of Public Service Award of Excellence for Scientific Contribution to Canada, the H.R. Macmillan Laureate in Agriculture and the Canadian Beef Industry Award for Outstanding Research and Innovation. He was also a contributor to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with former Vice President Al Gore. So let's please welcome Dr. McAllister. Give me a flag of appreciation. Oh, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thanks. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share some of the work uh, that we're doing uh, with you here today. It's great to come down uh, to Penn State. I was here about, I think, 12 or 14 years ago when Alex Haristoff uh, first joined uh, your group here. Alex and I met each other and worked together in Lethbridge, actually. And, I, I was really impressed with uh, uh, Alex's work ethic. I, I tried to emulate him, but there was no way I could keep up to that guy. So I just <laughs> gave up. Um, so I'm, I'm going to share a little bit about what we're doing from a One Health per perspective in terms of combating antimicrobial resistance. I think we've learned a lot about antimicrobial resistance. I don't know how much we've done to combat it. I think the war is still going. It's probably a war we won't win. It's a war where we're going to have to find some level of compromise, I think, if, if we're going to make any progress. So we know that uh, microbes, in terms of reality, they, they grow in communities. They don't typically grow alone. They don't grow very often in planktonic states. They grow more in biofilms. And it's through these biofilms we're really talking about when we talk about a microbiome, we're looking at interactions of a microbial community that live in close proximity to each other, uh, and either have synergistic or antagonistic effects on each other. When it comes to microbials, they can have a, a number of different functions. Uh, probably all antimicrobials were originally were, were used as communication molecules, not necessarily always from an antagonistic perspective. Uh, but we've taken and identified those molecules and we produce them in various systems at higher concentrations and we're introducing them into an environment, whether it be into the animal, or uh, uh, residues that might be coming off of manufacturing plants, et cetera, at concentrations that were probably much higher than what were originally there within the microbial communities from which they originated. Uh, so exchange of those genetic elements in terms of when we need to recognize that antimicrobial resistance is a natural phenomena, probably evolved shortly after the first bacteria evolved on the face of the earth. And, and when we look at the exchange of those genetic materials within those microbiomes or biofilms, that's what we're talking about and something we have to learn in terms of antimicrobial resistance. So it becomes really complex when you're dealing with a very broad microbial community. Uh, the types of antimicrobial resistance genes that those microbes harbor differ between species. The extent to which they exchange those antimicrobial resistance genes also vary 
among species. So it makes it really challenging to figure out what the risks really are and how likely those genes are to move from one species to another and where those may move through the environment, uh, either through uh, mobility from transfer from one microbe to another or the movement of that microbe itself uh, from one environment to another. Now, most of my work in terms of studying microbiomes has been in relation to agriculture. Uh, looking at, uh, for example, we've done work on composting where we look at microbiomes that are responsible for the decomposition of organic matter during in manure during composting. We've looked at microbiomes associated with respiratory health, particularly bovine respiratory disease in cattle and how antimicrobial resistance influences those. We've looked at how antimicrobials affect rumen function. We know we feed antibiotics to ruminant animals. It's always been a bit puzzling. Why doesn't that completely inhibit the microbial population in the rumen and actually have detrimental effects on digestion instead of positive effects on efficiency? Some of that has to do with the nature of the antimicrobial resistance genes that are there and the bacteria that either uh, are resistant or sensitive to those antimicrobials that are administered through the feed. Done a little bit on soil health as well, looking at how antimicrobial resistant bacteria move out into the broader environment and how long they persist within the soil. Uh, I haven't done as much in terms of direct interaction between epiphytic microbes and the plant itself. We've done work on water quality, collecting groundwater as well as surface water and looking for microbial antimicrobial resistant bacteria within those environments. And of course, then the uh, whole uh, antimicrobial populations, those microbiomes play a big role in carbon and nitrogen cycles, which has implications for greenhouse gas emissions. So they're all interconnected in one way or not. And, and when we look at antimicrobial resistance, for example, a lot of the work that's going on now is developing mechanisms to try to <laughs> alter the archaea within microbiomes in order to lower methane emissions. If the archaea or members of the community that produce the hydrogen that the archaea in turn use become resistant to those additives, we have a form of resistance to those antimicrobials. And as a result, they won't be as effective at lowering greenhouse gas emissions, or they may have a, only a short-term response where resistance develops over a matter of weeks and those additives are no longer effective. So antimicrobial resistance has many different aspects, not just in relation to human health or animal health, but even into some of the ways that we try to alter these uh, biogeochemical cycles in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. So my original training was in the rumen and it was a great place to train because it's one of the most complex microbial ecosystems on the planet in terms of the density and diversity of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms that environment uh, contains. Those microbiomes differ in different, like when you open up a rumen and you look inside the cannula, it kind of looks like a primordial soup. But in actual reality, those microbiomes are very specific to those that are associated with the epithelial, those that are associated with the digestion of the feed, and those that carry out uh, the transition from one environment to the other through the fluid. And we end up with different microbiomes uh, depending upon the type of feed we're feeding. So this is just some work I did in my PhD, it shows a microbiome that's forming on a starch granule. And at that time, we really didn't have the tools when I did this work in order to really identify which bacteria are there. So we used a lot of electron microscopy. We could always see, oh, there's a neat microbiome, but we really didn't have any idea who was part of that microbiome. With the whole advancements in molecular biology, then we were able to get and look at that in greater detail using, uh, in this case, we're using qPCR and, and 16S to identify these particular species. Uh, and this is just some work some time ago. Um, where we looked at those biofilms that are on the surface of the grain. And for those who are familiar with uh, rumen microbiology and rumen nutrition, we always kind of looked at lactic acid bacteria as the bad bacteria within the rumen because it produced lactic acid, which results in a lower pH and a condition called subclinical or clinical acidosis. And so we really didn't want to promote lactobacillus within the rumen, generally speaking. But when we went in and we looked at the biofilms that were involved in grain digestion, we actually found that lactobacillus in different varieties of wheat and in corn were major players in the digestion of starch uh, within that grain. They were within that microbiome uh, attached to the surface and producing amylases that were responsible for the digestion of the starch granules. So they probably are playing a pretty role, important role in starch digestion. Uh, but then when we looked at other microorganisms that were associated with that microbiome, including Salinomonas and Megasphera, those are bacteria that utilize that lactic acid. So in that environment, because you've got a complex microbiome there and those microbes are working together synergistically, 
You've got lactobacillus playing a really important role in starch digestion. We thought it was a bad bacteria. It's producing lactic acid, but the other bacteria within that uh, microbiome are using that lactic acid just as quickly as it's being produced. And as a result, when you measure the concentration of lactic acid in the broader rumen fluid, it's always kept uh, fairly low, almost uh, below detectable levels, unless you start to have a breakdown in that microbiome. And for some reason, they become less competitive and then lactic acid accumulates and then you end up with lactic acidosis. So that just showed that we had a bacteria that we thought really we, was undesirable, previously thought to be undesirable in the rumen, but actually does play an important role in feed digestion, provided that we maintain that balance within the microbiome. Now, I think we still tend to overlook many of the factors that can affect our interpretation of microbiome, and, and it's not easy to overcome these these limitations, but those limitations are always there in terms of the extraction procedure. We're usually going into environments which may contain kilos, or in the case of compost, tons of material, and we're only extracting milligram quantities of DNA out of that tons of material. And we're basing all of our interpretation on those milligrams of DNA that we end up getting out of that system. Uh, we know that the types of uh, uh, Primers that we select for 16S work, or if we use other uh, indicators like CPN60 for following genetic analysis, that changes the results that we end up getting. Uh, same with the ITS1 or 18S when we're looking at ruminal fungi, we see differences in results depending upon the nature of the primers we select. The long read versus short read coverage will change interpretation as well. The types of pipelines that you select will alter uh, the information. And really then the biological interpretation and whether you can link that with the metadata that you have available. Uh, it can't be underemphasized the importance of collecting as much metadata as possible that you can then relate back to the bioinformatic information that you generate from your analysis in order to try to draw conclusions. Often that metadata side is not well populated or well organized. And it's quite difficult to sustain that over a long period of time and build really large databases uh, that are generated and uh, populated by multiple organizations with consistent metadata so that you can basically put that all together for an interpretation at the end of the day. Um, anybody who's had that challenge in CBI, you just need to look at that and the variability that's there. That's even that's probably one of the better databases we have available for this kind of work. Uh, it still has its limitations in terms of that metadata that's available. So we started out like with the DNA extraction, doing a lot of qPCR, then went to shotgun sequencing for bioinformatic analysis, and have been doing quite a bit of transcriptomics, metatranscriptomics next. So first of all, we were only identifying who is there, which was informative, and there was a lot of predictive uh, programs developed based on the biochemical pathways of the bacteria that you identified, then predicting what the outcome would be in terms of metabolism from that community. It was a pretty predictive process and probably lots of assumptions made that may not have really conferred with biological reality. Then when we started to get into what they're doing through metatranscriptomics, what genes are actually being expressed, we find a big variability between the genes that are present and those that are actually expressed and environmental influences have a big effect in terms of selectivity and expression. And that's true for antimicrobial resistance as well. We often find bacteria that have antimicrobial resistance genes, but are not phenotypically resistant. And that's often related either to single nucleotide polymorphisms, one single gene change uh, that results in that particular gene not being active, or changes in expression of that gene where you are having sufficient expression in order to confer phenotypic resistance to the organism. So we start to learn more about what and how when we start to get into the transcriptomics. Now we've heard lots about how the human microbiome is influenced. We have to keep in mind that most of the work that's been done in humans has been done with material or micro populations that are falling out of the human, not those that are inherent within the human digestive tract itself. And we see all of these linkages to various types of diseases and you know, the significance of that microbial community and how it influences the overall health of the humans. And we see the same sort of linkages in the case of cattle where we have several genes or diseases that are connected to uh, microbiomes as well, such as bovine respiratory disease, uh, bloat, acidosis, splay table mason, lots of going on with liver abscesses. About 25% of cattle that are slaughtered still have liver abscesses. Uh, so it's a major issue. Mastitis, meritritis, foot rot, lots of things that are all connected to microbiomes. Some cases there's organisms across those diseases that are in common as well. 
And that's something that we're looking at, like for example, when we talk about uh, liver abscesses, fusobacterium is a major causative agent in liver abscesses. It's also a causative agent in foot rot as, as well. And it's present within the room and environment at, at the same time. So you can start to look at interlinkages across microbiomes within the same animal as well. So when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, of course, we've been developing antimicrobials uh, since the 1930 to try to control and alter microbial populations and particularly targeting pathogenic bacteria that cause infectious diseases in humans and animals. And there was a lot of activity in the 50s up to about the 80s in terms of new antimicrobials becoming available uh, that were capable of altering those populations in a selective manner. Differences in terms of target populations between gram-positive and gram-negative, not uh, a really high level degree of specificity in terms of only affecting a certain species, uh, which is very difficult to achieve through the use of antimicrobial, but is possible through alternative therapies like phage can have extreme levels of, of, of specificity. And then up to about 2000, we haven't seen very many new antibiotics develop uh, uh, at all. And we probably won't see new antibiotics develop particularly for use in livestock medicine. And any antimicrobials that are gonna be new ones that are gonna be emerging are likely gonna come out for, for use in human medicine. And even when we have seen new antimicrobials enter the market in terms of livestock uh, production, they've been a new antimicrobial that's of an existing class. And the problem with that is, is that it doesn't take very long for that uh, resistance to develop to antimicrobials that are of the same class because there's similar mechanisms and the mechanisms of resistance that uh, uh, evolve and are selected for are the same and eventually you'll lose resistance or the effectiveness of that antibiotic due to resistance. So it's a big cost to the industry. This, these are Canadian figures in terms of what it costs the Canadian healthcare system about $7.6 billion a year. Many people die of antimicrobial resistant infections because they've had a primary other disease related uh, event. And that, that's including my, my father actually passed away. He, it was uh, attributed to COP that he, that he had, but in reality, he had an antimicrobial resistant infection that, that was the reason he was immunocompromised. And, and that's what he died from in the end because they couldn't control it with the antimicrobials that they were using. And that's not uncommon now. That didn't, that got uh, reported that his fatality was reported as COP, not as antimicrobial resistance. So, so there are cases where there has been connections going. So, colistin resistance is one example where colistin was used in in swine production. Uh, it was banned from being used. And the reason for that was originally colistin uh, was tested and assessed as an antimicrobial for use in human medicine. Uh, and then when it was found to have too many bad side effects, they, they didn't prove it for humans, but they used it in livestock. Then the companion drugs that were used in human medicine, resistance was developing to those. So they wanted to take colistin and then start to use it in human medicine again. And then when they found out that it had been used in livestock, they related that back to the use of colistin in swine. And when they removed colistin from the utilization in, in, in livestock, they found a reduction in colistin resistance. And then there was some reduction in cholesterol resistance in humans in the coli as well. So there are examples of that, but they're not the common. This is another example of, of work that was done in Canada, actually looking at ceftiofur resistance. Uh, and you can see that there was an increase in ceftiofur resistance. They're using this in poultry. Uh, they had a voluntary reduction in use by the industry that resulted in a reduction in cholesterol resistance, both in humans and in the poultry. Uh, and then when they started to utilize it again, they see an increase again in retail chicken and, and turkey. And, and then when they eliminated it completely, they saw a reduction again in colistin, or sorry, in uh, septifer resistance in, in humans. So there are a few that you can find there, but in our work and our studies, we, we really haven't found that connection. Now, most of our work has been in beef. And when you look at the livestock species in terms of risk of antimicrobial use to human health, mm -hmm. poultry is probably number one, poultry and swine are pretty close, and then beef would be number Number three. Now I'm, I'm a co-PI on a pretty large project that's going on in Canada uh, that's looking at it, AMR from a One Health perspective. And uh, there's several different government organizations involved in that. Uh, and really that's what makes the study so strong. There's many different things that can affect the nature and flow of antimicrobial resistance from a One Health perspective. 
And this is just up illustrating the project that we've got going on as a whole. So it involves Agriculture Canada, our organization, CFIA, which is equivalent to the FDA, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, so we're covering aquaculture as well, Environment Canada, so we're looking at uh, antimicrobial resistance in pristine environments like in the high Arctic as well, also antimicrobial resistance associated with Indigenous communities that are within those environments. And then the Public Health Agency of Canada, which then gives us linkages to all the One Health from a human hospital perspective as well. So there's, a, there's probably about 50 scientists in total working on this across these organizations and their various sectors. And we're looking at drivers and reservoirs and dissemination, connects, connections to healthcare communities and vulnerable populations like the indigenous population that I mentioned. Methods to mitigate, mitigate transmission. So we really think the movement of those antimicrobial resistance genes amongst species and within species is really important. Uh, comparison of pathogens and across one health domain. So what differences are there in AMR profiles in pathogens across livestock, fish, and people? And then how can we use genomics to assess risk? And then what do we do in terms of real-time detection so that we can make management decisions uh, to alter uh, the likelihood of resistance development or at least lower the way to which resistance forms. So even when you look at all the different factors that affect, uh, can affect antimicrobial resistance, we're still only covering a few of those components. So we don't have a, a really big uh, program, for example, related to biosolids and sewage or, or uh, directly from meat within the program that we're, we're dealing with now. So when we look at, at the use of antimicrobials, though, about 80% of antimicrobials in Canada are sold to uh, production animals, uh, about 17% for people, less than 1% for cats and dogs, less than 1% for agriculture, and less than 1% for plants and crops. But the other thing to think about is the nature of the antimicrobials that are used. So the antimicrobials, many of the antimicrobials used in livestock production are not category one or those that are most important for use in humans. But if you look at that, then those are primarily obviously used in people, but they're also used in cats and dogs as well. So when you talk about risk, even though we're feeding low levels of cat, or applying low levels of antimicrobials to cats and dogs, if those are the same antimicrobials that are of greatest importance to human health, that represents a greater risk than something like using tetracycline in a livestock production unit. So we're using a number of different approaches to characterize antimicrobial resistance. Uh, so that includes both uh, going to isolation. So we're using indicator bacteria, including enterococci and E. coli, uh, where we collect those bacteria from those environments and sequence them and characterize their genomes uh, for a number of factors, including their phylogenetic nature, their uh, antimicrobial resistance profiles, heavy metal resistance profiles, biocide resistance profiles, and uh, the types of virulence factors they may contain as well. So all of those are helping us identify risk. So that's part of what we do in terms of direct isolation of, of, of bacteria from those environments. And then we're doing metagenomic sequencing as well. Some of it is uh, using PCR amplification with these with the sequenced amplicans. We're also using bait pull down where we increase our sensitivity to be able to detect antimicrobial resistant genes within those environments, as well as assembling and then generating metagenomically assembled genomes. So that starts to get into trying to relate back to which antimicrobial genes are associated with which microorganisms. And in some cases, those microorganisms may be unculturable in our selection techniques that we're using to try to culture them. And then we try to synthesize all that information and put it into a machine learning program so that we can use that to develop predictions and assess risks. Uh, so that's kind of what we've got going on in the overall program. And then if you apply that to all those environments that I just talked about, the human health, the livestock, the uh, water, surface water, uh, and, and in the fisheries area, then that's the type of program we have going on. So then we need to try to put it all together from a One Health perspective. So you start to look at then at the interrelationships across those. So specifically in our laboratory, we... We did E. coli and intercoci in the metagenomic DNA across uh, some from clinical samples where we collected or provided isolates from hospitals, as well as from cattle, swine, and poultry, and then also collecting from surface waters and, and uh, agricultural lands as well. 
So what are some of the conclusions that we came up with? Well, we originally selected enterococci as an indicator organism because there's a lot of macrolids that are used in beef cattle production. They're the primary antimicrobial used to control bovine respiratory disease. And that's the major reason why we administer antimicrobials to cattle, to beef cattle. And, and what we did is we collected isolates uh, from that continuum uh, and then we speciated them. So in most cases, hospitals were only identifying whether they were intercosi or not. They weren't identifying the exact species. And there's over 30 different species of androcosi that exist. Uh, and, and when we start to characterize those isolates, you can just see here we did the, we're, we're using uh, PCR for identification of the individual isolates in terms of their species. And when we did that work, you can see that in the cattle, we found Endrococcus hirae. Uh, then as we move from the cattle to the catch basin, so the broader environment, we still collect a lot of hirae, but we start to collect some of these other species that are present within the broader environment. When we go to the natural water sources, so the surrounding creeks and streams, we see less hirae and more of these other environmental microbes. But then when we go into the urban wastewater, so we're collecting sewage, uh, that's being effluent that's coming out into the uh, river systems, you can see that then we almost uh, change the profile completely and we start to collect only Anchococcus species and Fecalis. Those are associated with humans. When we go into the clinical system, system, so isolates that are being collected in the hospital, we find Fecalis and Fecium within those environments as well. So they're linking back to the urban wastewater, not back to the cattle. And then interestingly enough, even when we went into the beef processing plant, the isolates we got there, we still found some here, eh? but the majority were Andrococcus uh, fecalis or fecium. So we're finding human related isolates associated with the meat, not cattle related isolates. So obviously when you look at the level of risk here, your risk is gonna be much higher with urban wastewater or potentially with that beef because you're dealing with species that are fully capable of establishment and persistence within humans and cause infectious disease. When we looked at the antimicrobial resistant profiles, that basically confirmed what we, what we found when we looked at vancomycin resistance, uh, for example, here, which is a major concern. Uh, it's a last, only controlled by last resort antimicrobials. The resistance genes that we found with those isolates were almost exclusively associated with the isolates from humans, not the isolates from cattle. When we looked at the isolates from cattle, then we found a lot of tetracycline resistance and a lot of macrolid resistance. So the resistance within those isolates reflects the antimicrobial use from which the environment they originated from. And we find those kinds of linkages. Now that doesn't mean to say that we never found macrolidges genes in, 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 in uh, human isolates that were the same as those genes uh, that were in the isolates from cattle. We did find that, but also they're in different species. So then it comes the question, that's why I say the mobility is really important. To what extent can those genes move from one species of endercosi to another. We also did some genomics across the livestock species. So how much do they differ between uh, different species? We found that Fecalis and Fecium were a lot more prominent in poultry than they were in either swine or in cattle. So that's probably another reason why poultry gets a closer connection to human health as well. And when we look at those distributions across the broader livestock populations, you can see that the livestock ones tend to cluster together and the human ones cluster specifically. Now, this is just with Endrococcus uh, fecalis, so it's the same species uh, in livestock and in humans, but even then, from a genomic perspective, they differ. So these bacteria are evolving to the environment from which they originated from, and the environment in the human intestinal tract is different from that of livestock and poultry, so they end up with different traits. And we linked up with the group in the UK. There was uh, some work going on at Cambridge with Sharon Peacock's group, where she had done some similar studies looking across from a One Health perspective for endrocosi. And we combined the Canadian and UK data together and basically found similar patterns. So those endrocosi are evolving in a similar manner when they're on different continents. In that the human ones are, are more of this type A, you do have clusters. Uh, where there's clinical ones, there is some livestock ones dispersed throughout, uh, but they generally are in a different tree. So they're genomically different. So that doesn't mean that you never have a human related isolate appear in a livestock animal. That can occur, but it's a rare event. Now, if that isolate were to come in contact with a human, then you could have transmission uh, from the livestock to a human being in terms of that infectious organism. But the likelihood of that is much lower 
because it's rare in the livestock to begin with. We also tried, like we really have been trying and, and to, to try to find the smoking gun because as a researcher, if there's a problem where there's a clear linkage between the use of antimicrobials in livestock and infectious antimicrobial resistance in humans, we wanna to try to solve that problem, right? Because it's gonna come back to bite us if we don't deal with it. So in this work, what we did was carbapenamin is one of the most important antimicrobials used in human medicine in terms of a last resort. Uh, and we don't want it compromised uh, in terms of by use of antimicrobials in livestock. So what we did in this work is we deliberately enriched for carbapenamin resistant bacteria within the feedlot environment. So we're using selective plates, trying to selectively isolate any bacteria from that environment that exhibit carbapenamin resistance. So once we had done that susceptibility testing, and then we tested the isolates that we got to make sure they produced the enzyme carbapenamase uh, to, to ensure that they were in fact carbapenamin resistance. And when we did the comparative genomics on that, we found that there was really no uh, human related pathogens. So for example, in E. coli, we didn't find any carbapenamin resistance. We did find it in environmental isolates like Pseudomonas uh, within that environment. And, and uh, in some cases, those environmental bacteria are intrinsically resistant to carbapenamins. Uh, so it may not have to do, it may have to do with more of their structure, cell wall structure or other components rather than specific resistance genes. In some cases, we did find some of those environmental bacteria that did contain carbapenamin resistance genes. Then the question is, what, to what extent could those genes move to other bacteria that are more likely to cause infection in either livestock or in humans? And that's something we're working on. But the big conclusion was, is that we couldn't, even with highly selective methods, we still couldn't find carbapenamin resistant bacteria within the beef production system. So that genomic information with those thousands of isolates, that's what we've been using to try then to develop our machine learning techniques. And I have a PhD student working with Rob Biko at uh, Dalhousie in this area. So where you take all that genomic information and then try to see whether or not, based on the differences in those genomes and the phenotypic information that we have on antimicrobial resistance, can we predict unknown enterococci as to whether they're phenotypically resistant or not, just based on genomic data. So that, that involves taking the genomes and assemblies, then encoding the data, and then identifying features, and then running that through an algorithm, and then using that uh, train model then to look at a control data set to see to what extent you can express uh, predict uh, phenotypic resistance, then go back and look at the metadata that you already have where you do know the resistance of those test organisms and see how well your predictive model matches uh, what the actual phenotypic resistance is. And so we've used the combined data sets of our Canadian data set with the UK data set to look at, at these predictions. And specifically, we were looking at predicting in enterococci vancomycin and doxycycline and erythromycin resistance. And you can see that our accuracy was pretty high, around 99%, uh, 98 to 99%, uh, which depends on the features you select, uh, the antibiotic and the classifiers that you use with regard to the efficiency of that machine learning in terms of prediction. Now that's only for three antimicrobials. There's a lot more antimicrobials that you could test. And that prediction ability differs depending upon which antimicrobial you're talking about. Uh, so to achieve like 99% with all antimicrobials that the bacteria could potentially be resistant to would be a big challenge. Part of this limitation of this as well is that you're dealing with enterococci from those different environments. In order to do the machine learning, you need as many isolates as possible from every representative environment that you're testing the organisms, the unknown organisms from. And we have a large amount of of isolates that are related to the human health sector or those that we collected out of the livestock, we have very few that originated from the environment. So our ability to predict the resistance and enterococci that originate from the environment is gonna be much lower than what it is for those that are associated with, with the health sector. So just to go through then some of the metagenomics that we've done, this is looking, we, we did this work with Paul Marley, uh, looking at across the beef production sector Looking at the types of resistance genes that we see in feces, soil, water, avatar, we found many more unique antimicrobial resistance in the soil environment than what we found in, 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 uh, in either the livestock or in the avatar. Um, and when we look at the avatar, we didn't find any unique genes, which 
basically suggests that when we look at what we're supposed to be doing in the abattoir, which is reducing the likelihood of pathogenic bacteria entering the food chain, a lot of the processes that we have in place are effective at doing that. They're not infallible, but at least they're going in the right direction in terms of controlling that. And then when we look at the differences in the composition, so naturally the types of species of bacteria that are there differ between the feces, the catch basin and the soil and the sewage effluent. And that, and that corresponds to what I showed with the uh, work, that, the isolation which worked with the enterococci, right? Uh, and then when you look at that, if you change the composition of that microbiome, then you also change its antimicrobial resistance profile because the genes are associated with specific species. So we get a lot of firmicutes and, and other organisms associated with the fecal where you get a lot more proteic bacteria associated with, with soils. So that profile also corresponds to changes in antimicrobial resistance. And that's just shown here where we've got the various antimicrobial classes that we're looking at. And you can see that when we look at antimicrobials that are used more in humans, like the fluoroquinolones, uh, and, and uh, the glycopeptides, we see some of those more in soil or in sewage effluent than we see them in the livestock in the beef cattle related environment. And when we look at the ones that are predominant within beef cattle, it's the tetracyclines and, and the uh, macrolid resistance that predominate. And those are the primary antimicrobials that are used within that environment as well. So when you're talking about an, a selection or classification of metagenomic DNA from a specific environment, the types of resistance genes will be a reflection of the antimicrobial use that's going on within that environment. So then they separate out uh, when you look at both the microbiota and on their antimicrobial resistance genes profiles. And this is just the point I made, differences in phylogenetic makeup will result in differences in AMR profiles as well. We've also done work comparing conventional versus natural feedlots. And, and really when we look at that, we find differences the makeup is pretty similar. The abundance can differ between phyla, between conventional and natural feedlots. Natural feedlots are feedlots that don't use any antimicrobials at all. Uh, and when you look at the antimicrobial resistance, we, sign, we see a lower abundance of antimicrobial resistance genes in the natural feedlot. So there's no selective activity going on there in terms of immediate antimicrobial use. Uh, but the profile itself stays relatively the same. Now, whether that's a reflection, those cattle are coming from the cow-calf sector, right, and being transferred to the feedlot, is that material or residual activity that was associated with antimicrobial use uh, when they were on the cow-calf farm? We don't really know that, but what it does say is that converting to a natural system is not going to immediately eliminate antimicrobial resistance, and it also leads that if you were to introduce antimicrobials into that production system, you'd probably select it out and be back to the conventional system level in a very short period of time. One of the interesting things we recently found though is that the distribution of those antimicrobial resistance genes are different. Uh, we found that the chromosomal relationship of conventional versus antibiotics, so the degree of antimicrobial genes that are associated with the chromosome was relatively the same. But when we looked at the antimicrobial resistance genes that were associated with plasmids, they were much greater in conventional than they were in antibiotic free. So that, and, and then of course the amino glycoside and tetracyclines were higher in conventional versus antibiotic free as well. And a large portion of that was found on the plasmids. So that might represent a greater level of risk in the conventional system because those antimicrobial resistant genes may exhibit a greater degree of mobility as a result of antimicrobial use. So this is just some really recent work we just did and it's an interesting finding. And it may be something you know, where there is some advantages if we reduce the mobility of those genes through, convent, through natural systems, there could be some advantages of that because generally speaking, antimicrobial genes that are associated with plasmids are more mobile than those that are, that are associated with the chromosomes. And we find that uh, same pattern in terms of relationship between, this is in study with beef cattle, uh, broilers and swine. And you can see that the conventional versus natural really didn't make that much difference in any of those three systems. So it doesn't only apply to beef, it also applies to chickens and, 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 to, and to swine as well. And the tetracycline resistance was very high in all of those environments. Uh, but there were some conditions, for example, that you know, there was a increased resistance associated with, with swine and poultry relative to beef. We don't use any related antibiotic to speak of in beef cattle. So that accounts for that difference. Again, replacing 
reflecting back that the nature of the resistance reflects the antimicrobial use within that environment. And then this is just, just some work that we did that was the soil related mention that I mentioned where we were looking at uh, different antimicrobial resistance genes in the soil environment. And this is uh, land that had manure applied to it up until 2003. And you can see that the, the types of resistant genes, they, 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 they applied manure up to 2003, then stopped applying manure. Applying manure increased the antimicrobial resistance genes in most cases in that environment. Um, but once it was dis discontinued, you start to see a plateau and that decline differs depending upon the type of antimicrobial you're talking about. So it's really difficult when you're asked the question, is antimicrobial resistance going up or is it going down? It really depends what antimicrobial you're talking about. And that may be a reflection as well, any residues that are associated with there, how persistent are those residues in the environment? In the work that we've done measuring the residues, we saw some residues break down in the feedlot pen before the manure is moved out of the pen itself. Others persist, those would residues would then end up into the soil environment upon application of that manure to the land. Then the question is, what is the concentration of those residues? Are those residues at a concentration that's high enough in order to exert a selective pressure? If they're not, it may be just a matter of time before they degrade within that soil environment without exerting any selective pressure for selecting for antimicrobial resistance within the broader environment as well. So you have to ask when you're asked that question, what antimicrobial are you talking about and what bacteria are you talking about as well? Because those bacteria, if they're carrying those genes, may persist to different degrees within the environment that they're being transferred to as well. So I also mentioned we've done quite a bit on, on bovine respiratory disease as well. And the reason why we got into that is because it's the major reason why we use antimicrobials. It's the number one disease in terms of uh, economic cost to the industry as well. And it's very complex in terms of all the various factors that can lead to the occurrence of bovine respiratory disease. Uh, we focus to some extent on stress and its impact in transportation. I have a colleague, Karen schwarzkopf genswein She's done quite a bit of work on how transportation distances and that affect stress. And that all has an implication for the degree of BRD that will develop within the feedlot. We've shown that by preconditioning the animals, uh, which involves adapting them to the diet prior to transport, transporting them as short a distance as possible, avoiding co-mingum and a lot of those other stressful factors can reduce antimicrobial use by 80% within the feedlot pretty effectively, but the, then it's economics, how you capture the value for doing that. So when we look at the, the distribution of, of uh, isolates in BRD versus non-BRD, we find a lot of the causative agents like Mannheim hemolytica, mycoplasm, both Christophilus somni and Pastorella multocida are all components of that. So we confirm that as being part of the microbiome. Now, those are actually commensals in many cases of the upper respiratory tract. It gets complicated because in the case of Mannheimia hemolytica, there's several different serotypes. Uh, serotype two really doesn't cause bovine respiratory disease, but it's a prominent organism within the respiratory tract of the cattle. Serotype one and serotype six cause bovine respiratory disease. So if you want an assay, you know, just simply identifying Mannheimia hemolytica is not sufficient in order to assess risk. You need to know what serotype it is as well. Uh, so, so it's not as simple as people would like it to be in terms of rapid diagnostics in many cases. And we find uh, a lot of those bacteria are, are resistant to uh, penicillins and to macrolids and to various, can possess various genes as well for tetracycline resistance as well. And then we've, we've done quite a bit, and we're quite interested and we have a project going on right now where we're focusing on these ice, so integrative conjugative elements. And what these integrative conjugative elements do is they concentrate antimicrobial resistant genes within the genome mm -hmm. and they integrate into the chromosome directly. And we have seen Manhami hemolytica, and we actually originally isolated it out of the United States, uh, that's resistant to 14 different antimicrobials. So every antimicrobial that's approved for using uh, treating bovine respiratory disease, they're resistant to them all except for septiofure. Mm -hmm. That was the only one it was sensitive to. And those mobile genetic elements can move from, if they move from one Mannheimia hemolytica serotype one to another Mannheimia serotype one, and that mm -hmm. second sero serotype was originally sensitive to all those antimicrobials. As soon as that conjugative element moves, it immediately becomes resistant to all 14 antimicrobials, just like that. So it's, it's not, that's why I say antimicrobial resistance is not a random process. Uh, that kind of transfer event immediately makes that 
individual robust to all of those antimicrobials. And we find that these ice elements are really prominent and they're particularly prominent in the members of the bovine respiratory disease complex, Manhami hemolytica, Camophilus somni, and uh, Pastorella montosida, and they share the same ice elements. So we think they're transferring these ice elements between themselves and that's leading to greater resistance in the overall complex. And, and that's one of the studies we've got going on right now is to what extent does that transfer take place? And interestingly enough, that one that I talked about where we have 14 resistant to 14 different antibiotics, we've only isolated that organism out of dead cattle. We haven't ever found it in healthy animals. So, you know, that's where we talk about identifying and, and, and focusing on the risk. Obviously, I think that that particular organism is a pretty big risk. So can we identify that specifically? You know, an animal has Manheimi hemolytica coming into the feedlot. So what? What, what Manheimi is it? What's the risk? But if it has that particular Manheimi hemolytica, then I'd have the alarm bells going. That's the level of sensitivity and specificity we need if we're really going to make a difference in our antimicrobial use pattern. So what can we do in terms of managing these microbiomes? Well, there's a whole bunch of things going on out there. Antimicrobials are obviously ones that have been broadly used. The vaccines as well. You know, it, there's a lot of things that affect the efficacy of vaccine. Obviously, you need a immune response to a vaccination in order to be effective. Often, sick animals don't respond well to vaccines. Diet can have an influence as well. If they're nutritionally compromised upon arrival at the feedlot, that's going to increase the level of, of uh, disease and development of undesirable microbiomes. Probiotics are being used. Most of those need to be administered every day. They may have more applications in young animals where the microbiomes are not fully established yet. Generally speaking, our work that we've done with probiotics find that if you just administer an organism uh, that's not from that environment, uh, was grown in the laboratory under very nice conditions, uh, it doesn't last very well. We did some work where we were looking at using uh, propionic bacterium. The idea was we'd increase propionate production in the rumen, lower methane emissions because we'd have more propionate. Propionate's a hydrogen sink. Uh, when we do, do dose that into the animal using, we had uh, very specific primers just for that particular isolate. It lasted in the room for about seven hours and then it was gone and that's the end of it. So, and let, you know, it's very difficult. It's possible to administer something every day, but to get something to establish and integrate into that microbiome is a really huge challenge. We've also done a lot of work with bacteriophage. That's where we can have the high level of specificity. We have phage that will only kill E. coli 157 and not other serotypes of STEC. Uh, likewise, we can have ones that have broader specificity and include both salmonella and E. coli. Um, plant bioactives, early life programming, as I mentioned before, the microbiome is fully established. But a lot of these things like and CRISPR-Cas as well, great in the laboratory, not as easy to see how you're gonna apply it in the broader field. Um, a lot of these things, when it comes to what's the major factor that determines the nature of the microbiome within the animal, I would say it's the diet. You know, those are the substrates you're providing to that microbiome. That's going to largely dictate the nature of that microbiome. So uh, when you look at early life programming, you might be able to have an effect earlier on. But if you have dramatic changes in diet, you may change that microbiome later on in life. And I think some of the work that's going on suggests that that's the case uh, in, in terms of those changes. So one of the things that we're hoping to work towards is, is how do we use metagenomics to assess risk? of antimicrobial resistance or of disease. And so this is just some things we can think about in terms of the species of bacteria present. Is there a species present that obviously causes disease in humans or in livestock? So the Manahymia is an example. There we've got a species that causes disease, but then we need the right serotype as well. What types of antimicrobial resistance genes do they contain? Do they just contain tetracycline re resistance? Tetracycline resistance is so widespread, I'm not sure it's much of an issue. Do that contain genes coding for resistance to carbapenemin of last resort. That's a, that's a problem. If it's got that gene, then that represents more risk. What's the nature of those mobile genetic elements? Is it just a plasma that has a tetracycline in gene on it, or is it an ice element that's resistant to 14 different antimicrobials? What virulence factors does it contain? Does it really have the virulence factors necessary to cause disease? We have isolates of E. coli 0157 that lack the virulence factors. They don't cause disease in people. Uh, what traits confer resistance, fitness? If that bacteria is moving from environment to environment, uh, does it have the traits in order for it to survive and persist within that environment? One of the big differences we saw between Andrococcus hirae and Fecalis 
is that Enterococcus hirae had some carbohydrates that were more adept to digesting the type of carbohydrates that would be presented uh, within the digestive tract of cattle relative to what would be present in the fecal. Uh, indicator features that we can use to predict those and whether they contain prophages and, and can we use those metagenomic assembled genomes to get an idea of the resistance and, and characteristics of the unculturable, uh, which may be also harboring resistance. So where do we need to go? Community and herd health through sewage and agricultural waste streams. We've had a huge increase, is, and we know in terms of using uh, sewage waste streams to monitor COVID, we can use the same sort of approach uh, in terms of monitoring antimicrobial resistance, both in human and agricultural waste streams. Much more complicated than COVID because we've got to monitor a lot more genes, uh, but possible. Uh, increased emphasis on community networks and interactions, so really closing the gaps within that one health cycle. Greater emphasis on function and not just who is present in microbiomes. We've had a lot of papers on who's there, but not really what they're doing, and even less so how they're interacting. Uh, cell, cell, cell signal among members in the host, cross feeding among members in the microbiome, and of course the exchange of AMR genes. And then ultimately, can we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to synthesize all that information into ability to make AMR predictions or infectious disease risk assessments? so that we can change management practices to deal with the problems. That's where we hope to go. So that's my team. I collaborate with a lot of people in different places. I'm not a bioinformaticist, so I, all the bioinformaticists is done by other collaborators uh, and work with several universities, both Canada and internationally. So that, that's really why we can do such broad work. It's, I'm just kind of the mouthpiece. So <laughs> So it looks like we have a little bit of time for questions. Uh, as usual, the, that's the first question to come from a trainee. Yeah. Yeah, so question for you. So you mentioned the importance of serotyping, menthymia, hemolytica, or these common pathogens to figure out if they're actually causing the respiratory disease. But diagnostically, those are really, really expensive to do, and a lot of labs don't even do it. How do we go about that, like from a veterinary recommendation and things like that? Well, we've, we've, we've been developing some assays for rapid analysis that are looking specifically at those genes. We haven't published, we published a little bit of that work. It's recombinant uh, polymerase that we're using. Uh, so it, it is an assay that does lend itself to application in the field uh, and it's rapid and we're using the genetic information that we have there to look at, it'll only identify serotype one, for example. Okay. So it's very specific and it's pretty fast as well. We're doing the same thing. The, the latest one is I mentioned the ICE gene. So we've looked at a lot of the other ancillary genes that are associated with that ICE element. And we found that that ICE element is actually associated with unique genes as well. So we can now, we're developing the assay that will only detect that particular 16 ICE. We don't need to know every ICE, right? Sure. But one that's got resistance to 14 antimicrobials is that one we'd like to know about. Yeah, that's so that's doing. what we're doing. Uh, Obviously, the industry would like us to be able to perform that test in under two minutes. It still takes us 30 minutes. Okay. To do that. That's, that's right. still faster. Than but nobody wants to leave the cow in the chute for 30 minutes. So mm -hmm. it's still not fast enough. <laughs> yeah. So are there good predictive scripts for antimicrobial resistance genes? Like, can you take a metagenome or a genome? and quickly run it through a script yeah, to- Yeah, we do that. So there's a few databases that, that do that. There's like a, a McMaster's group there, that's basic, they're, they're bread and butter. They're doing that continuously. And, and they're probably in terms of continuous maintenance of those databases, which needs to be done and updating because there's new genes discovered every month. Uh, they're probably one of the best in the world at doing that. Um, but what the problem is, is that we still find bacteria that, as I mentioned, have the resistance genes and are not phenotypically resistant. We also find bacteria that are resistant and don't have any of the gene. So that means there's still genes there, you know, that so-called what we used to call when I would start, when molecular biology started up back many years ago, uh, when they used to call all this junk DNA, right? There was all this junk DNA there. I don't think there is any junk DNA. There's that, all that DNA has a purpose. Some of it's regulatory. Some of it's these unknown proteins of unknown function. Some of those unknown proteins of unknown function code for antimicrobial resistance. We've discovered a couple of them, but there's other groups that do their full-time job discovering new antimicrobial resistance as well. 
Um, I'm not super familiar with like cattle feedlots. You mentioned an abattoir, which um, reduces pathogens. Somehow I was wondering if you could just kind of elaborate on that a little bit more and how that works. Well, if, so it was, it was, it was a big, it was uh, uh, Cargill that we're dealing with. So these, the, the organization that those, those cattle were slaughtered at is killing 4,000 head of cattle a day, or more than that, actually 8,000 head a day. But uh, you know, E. coli 157, and you know about the jack in the box and all of that issues that happened. And then it, the U.S. declared E. coli 157 an adulterant, which meant that if it's contaminated, it couldn't enter the food chain, right? So that really forced the industry to take a lot of steps in food safety, which they did. And, uh, and you know, such as thermal hydraulic acid washes. There's a whole bunch of passive type procedures that they put in place to reduce the risk of a pathogen entering the food chain, particularly 0157 is what they're measuring. And, and they've been effective at that. So now if you look at the data uh, in terms of infections of 0157 in people, most of those are coming from produce or other sources. They're not coming from ground beef anymore. And that's because of those uh, food safety programs that have been implicated in the plants. Now, as we know, bacteria are masters of adaptation, right? I give a whole bunch of things alternative things. So we always talk about alternative to antimicrobials. We'll, sign, we'll solve the antimicrobial resistance issue by developing an alternative. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, but that's crap because the bacteria will adapt to whatever you come up with anyway, right? I said phage are a great thing. Bacteria will adapt to phage too. They can become resistant to phage as well. And they'll adapt to environments. So we think probably in this plant now, the biggest issue are bacteria that actually adapt to that slaughterhouse environment. So they're thermal tolerant, bioside tolerant, they readily form biofilms and equipment where you can't easily clean them. And then occasionally they fall off into the food supply and they end up in the food supply as well. And we've been isolating some of those from the plants. I work with another group up in a sister station of ours and we find bacteria like that within those environments. So now how do we control those resistant biofilms within a plant environment? That's another, so bacteria, you know, they usually find a way that's why I said we got to sort of get a compromise, not expect total destruction or win the war completely. Our time maybe for one more brief question. Um, I'm not familiar with the uh, antibiotics, but I was wondering if, for example, a person uh, becomes um, resistant to tetracyclines, for example, if that person stops taking it for, I don't know, five years, 10 years, could that be reversed? Yeah, so I think the question was if, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but if somebody uh, has a resistant bacteria and if they stop taking antimicrobials, will it reverse the situation? The answer to that, it depends. It depends on which antimicrobial you're talking about and which resistance you're talking about. For example, the tracyclines. I, I think it's safe to say that it will definitely decrease it but it may not completely eliminate it. So they, like a good example is bacitracin in the in the Europe, they eliminated it uh, because it was causing problems with resistance and they go back into those environments 10 years later. It's definitely much lower than it was when they were using the antimicrobial, but it's still not zero. And if you think about it from the perspective of survival of the microbial population, uh, it doesn't make sense for the population as a whole to maintain a resistant element if it's never subjected to that selective pressure again, right? But if it's a chance that it may be, it might make sense for a very small portion of that population to maintain that selective element in the event that that population may come encounter that selective pressure again at some point in the future. So that's why I don't think, I think it's often not eliminated to zero completely within the population. It might be quite low, but if there's a selective pressure and it's there, it'll, it'll come back up again. So environment is a... Yeah. All right, well, let's thank him one more time for coming. <laughs>